Well, good morning. If you've got your Bibles with you, why don't you turn to the book of First Timothy, chapter one. Last week, we started our journey through First Timothy, started in an unusual place, in the middle of the book, chapter three. You'll be happy to know. Today, we're going to go right back to the beginning and follow it sequentially from here on out. So turn or tap in your Bibles to First Timothy, chapter one, and let's go. Let's read. We have... No time for small talk today. If you're ready, let's go. Verse one. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by command of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus our hope, to Timothy, my true child in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, Remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies which promote speculation rather than stewardship from God that is by faith. The aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Certain persons, by swerving from these, have wandered away into vain discussion, desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they are saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. Now we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who strike their fathers and mothers, for murderers, the sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine in accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. So you know who else had no time for small talk? The Apostle Paul. He's writing this letter to his young protege, Timothy, who he's super close to. He refers to him as my son in the faith. He hasn't seen Timothy for a while. He had left him in charge of the church at Ephesus, had probably been away about two years. This is presumably his first interaction with this young man that he's so close to, and he wastes no time with how's it going, how are you doing, how's the weather. He jumps straight into heavy business. Straight in. This is the opening of the letter. It's kind of why last week I wanted to get there in the middle because this is how it opens. The tone is, Timothy, put a stop to the false teachers and the false teaching that's happening among you. And it seems like from this opening passage that you can identify these false teachers or identify false teaching in three ways. So just three things that they were doing. So first, these false teachers teach, in verse three, what he calls a different doctrine. Secondly, other mistake that they're making, verse four, they are devoted to myths. And thirdly, verse eight, they apply the law incorrectly. That is a whole lot of material for us to deal with today. Luckily, two of them we can combine, number one and three. Let me show you that. If you're reading through 1 Timothy and you look at where the issue of sound doctrine comes in, it comes up six times, it's a big part of the letter. And on two of those occasions, he's quite specific about what that sound doctrine or the incorrect doctrine is. For example, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 to 5. Let's read this. It's going to be important for us later. Now, the Spirit expressly says that in later times, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons 
through the insincerity of liars, he is not pulling any punches about these guys whose conscience, consciences are seared, who, this is what they're doing, who forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is made holy by the word of God and prayer. So this is part of the same letter and he brings up what different doctrine is and what it seems to be is these false teachers were incorrectly handling the law. Firstly, they were making up new laws, making up new commandments. For example, they were forbidding guys to get married. Like where did they get that from? But there's something out there No, you are not allowed to be married. Thank goodness that isn't incorrect. That is a false teaching. So they were inventing new laws, but they were also applying some of the laws that should no longer be applied because they have passed away. For example, not eating certain foods. I mean, he goes on to call that teaching that there's some food you can't can't eat. He calls that teaching the teachings of Demons, that's right, don't tell me I can't have my bacon, you're all like, that is from the devil. <laughs> so they're making up new laws, they're applying laws that should no longer be applied, and then if you look at the other occasion in First Timothy where the issue of sound doctrine comes up, chapter six, don't have to worry about turning there, he's talking about something that should be applied, it is a, a law, but they're not applying it, and it is the issue of workers needing to honor their bosses. Can I hear an amen to that one? We're gonna get there later. I'm gonna be so happy to preach that one. It's gonna be mandatory attendance for Rosebank Union staff. (laughs) So this is a law that they should be applying, but they're somehow missing this one. Basically, what we can tell from 1 Timothy about different doctrine is it actually has to do with number three, an unlawful use of the law. They were applying the law incorrectly, which is what he spells out in verse eight to 11. That's where we're gonna spend the rest of our time today. As for number two, the subject of myths, I was really trying to find a way to include that here because what that means for us today is our tendency for conspiracy theories Big deal, not gonna have time to deal with it today. Would love to go there. We're gonna go there on the podcast on Wednesday. So listen out for that. But I feel like this, number one and three, is most important for us. So today, we're gonna talk about the correct use of the law. Now, let me just warn you, just give you a heads up, y'all, those of you at home. Hopefully, you got a good cup of coffee, you guys here. You, you're not allowed to be drinking coffee now, but hopefully you slept well, you had a great nutritious breakfast because we are doing some heavy, heavy lifting this morning. I kid you not, the territory that we're going into today on how a Christian today correctly handles and applies the law is, I think, and many other scholars agree, the most complex theological issue, but we've got to deal with it because it is the subject of First Timothy in the beginning. And that's why we teach through books of the Bible, because we cannot avoid difficult subjects. So let's go there. We're gonna walk through this, take our time to completely to try and understand this by going through six questions about the law, and we'll get to how that relates to us. So first question, what is the law? When Paul talks about here about the unlawful use of the law. What law is he referring to? And when he talks about the law in the rest of his letters, which by the way, comes up a lot. Romans is filled with this discussion. Galatians is filled with this discussion. When he refers to the law, what exactly is he referring to? Well, that on its own is a great question because the law could refer to, first of all, all of the instructions in the whole Bible. So every time you get to an instruction like here or in the Old Testament, that is part of the law. It could also refer to, if you narrow that a bit, the Old Testament. Sometimes the law refers to the whole Old Testament. Sometimes, I would say most often, it refers to the first five 
books of the Bible, Genesis through to Deuteronomy. You may know this, but Jews today and Christians today call that collection, the first five books, the Torah. Torah is often translated uh, the law because of all the laws in those first five books of the Bible. You've seen that? Ever tried to, I'm gonna read through the Bible in a year, and you start in Genesis, and you're so pumped up, it's all these amazing stories. You get to Genesis 19, Mount Sinai, the covenant, skip, skip, skip. Hey, you know, Leviticus, ooh, skip, skip, skip. Now, you know what I mean? Like, you just come across all of these laws, commandments, and instructions, and so we call that the Torah, which has been translated as the law, but it's not. Actually, what the Torah, the word Torah means is instruction. Sounds like nothing, but it's significant. Hold on to that. We're going to come back to that later. So sometimes when we say the law, or Paul says the law, it refers to the first five books, the Torah. Sometimes, narrow that even further, it refers specifically to the law codes there in Exodus and Leviticus minus all of the other stories. So it's literally, if you had to just summarize all of the instructions. And by the way, if you wanna go do that, if you wanna go count how many there are, there are 613 of them, right? And, and that may sound like just random, you know, helpful, useless bits of information. But here's what's interesting. Hebrew, every Hebrew word has a numerical value assigned to it. And the word Torah, the numerical value of Torah is, guess what? Here's one number. Take a stab, 600 and 13. Which of these are we referring to when Paul speaks many times about the law? Answer, we don't know exactly. And we're not really meant to know. And you'll see why later. So just pause, let's hold on to that for now. What is the law? Number two, what is the purpose of the law? So even the broad view of every instruction in the Bible or the narrow view of that list, 613 specific instructions, what is the purpose of them? The purpose of all of the laws and commands, all of them is, this is important, to reveal the nature of God, to reveal the nature of human beings, and therefore to begin to describe how human beings can relate to God. That's why it's important that Torah is instruction because all of it is teaching us something about God and something about how we can relate to him. Now this is really important because one of the greatest misconceptions of the law and of the law code. The misconception is that the law we think, it is like this divine behavior manual that drops from the skies, random commandments to obey. But the purpose of them is primarily to tell us how fallen human beings can relate to a holy God. Now you can see this very clearly when you go to the seminal, the central moment in the Bible of the giving of the law. So this is Moses and the Israelites at Mount Sinai. That's where this all begins. And you've got to go there when you want to get your head around the laws. But you've got to park at Exodus 19 for a little bit before that law is given because there's critical information about why God is about to be very detailed about how to relate to him. So let's go there, Exodus 19, reading from verse one to six. So on the third new moon, after the people of Israel had come out of the land of Egypt, so just after that happened, on that day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. They set out from Rephidim and came into the wilderness of Sinai and they encamped in the wilderness. There Israel encamped before the, before the mountain while Moses went up to God. The Lord called to him out of the mountain saying, thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and tell the people of Israel, This is what you must say to them, Moses. 
before these commands come. Say this, you yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all the peoples. For all the earth is mine. P.S. I could pick anybody, but I'm picking you. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you shall speak to the people of Israel. That's the preamble to the giving of the law. You go right on through, you go Exodus 20 to 31 is all very, very detailed instructions about the law. It is this law code. But what you can see from Exodus 19 is that the purpose of the law is clearly to describe a covenantal, personal relationship between God and a community of human beings. The words there are beautiful. I bore you on eagle's wings. I brought you to myself. You will be my treasured possession. Now let me just pause here and tell you how shocking this is. We have tons of archeological material today that shows us examples of similar covenant kind of contracts and law codes from the ancient people of the Near East of that time. We have Hittite covenants, um, Assyrian covenants. You can, you, can go and you can read them, and they look very similar. In fact, a lot of the instructions are exactly the same, which is a whole rabbit hole that we can't go down. But for one massive difference, every single one of those other covenant-type agreements with law codes attached to them are between a king and another king. Or even there's examples of between gods, gods and their goddesses, there's examples of how they relate to each other. There is nothing in existence about how a sovereign, powerful, holy God would relate to people. In those times, kings were seen elevated, almost seen as gods, but the people were nothing. You have zero example of anything that shows of a God wanting to relate personally to people, which is exactly what you are seeing in the giving of this covenant. And you see it all over. For example, there's this very familiar phrase, homework, y'all, like just go and find out how many times this comes up in the Bible, where God says, he says it to Moses while they're in Egypt, before he delivers them, he says, when this happens, I will be their God. And you finish the sentence, they will be my people which by the way, is very similar language to another book in the Old Testament, a book we also avoid, the Song of Songs, which is about what? It's about your man and woman and the delicacies and delights of marriage. And you'll know there's an, there a verse, Song of Solomon, six verse three, it says, I am my beloved and he is mine. That's very similar language. I will be their God and they will be my people. In other words, this kind of relationship even with all of its law codes, is a marriage type of relationship. It is personal. And this is going to be important. You're going to see this has come up. This is going to come up again. But between a holy God and not so holy, unholy people, the nature of that beautiful covenant relationship has to be described in these kinds of instructions that therefore are centered around the idea of purity. How man relates to God in purity and how mankind relates to each other. The point of this, God was selecting and calling a people to be his treasured possessions 
He gave instructions that would show how they should relate to him in love and relate to each other in love. The point was that through them they would be, did you pick up this language? A kingdom of priests. In other words, that the rest of the world would look in on this and see a microcosm of how a holy God, when he dwells literally among a community of people in a way that can actually make that possible, where they love God and where they love each other, it would show the world what that looks like and the human flourishing that would result from it. That was what was supposed to happen. But it didn't, because, because why? The people did not live in accordance with this. And you see that right away, Moses gets these instructions of which part of it is the 10 commandments. We know that bit, right? Do you know what's the first commandment? It's a quick pop quiz, first commandment. Yeah, love the Lord your God. You shall not love or worship any other God. Number one, Moses comes down the mountain. He's like, God, this is amazing. You never imagine what God is gonna do. And what does he find at the bottom of the mountain? He finds his brother Aaron. They've built a golden calf. Like the tablets are still hot off the press. They've just chiseled them. And they've already broken the covenant. And then more instructions come and they break it and more come and they break it. And it's this endless cycle of trying to show people how to live in relationship with God, to love him and to love others. But they keep breaking the covenant, which, as we know, has disastrous consequences. Remember, if they keep the covenant, if they abided by the covenant, and you can see this in Moses' summary in Deuteronomy before he passes on, if they abide the covenant, what, what's the result? The result is, well, they will be God's treasured possession. And so therefore he will dwell, his presence will be manifested in their midst, his provision will be over them and his protection will be over them. If they live like this, it's beautiful. But if they don't, they lose all of that. What's the result? One word, exile. In the Garden of Eden, there were instructions there too, by the way, and they disobeyed, exile and the great exile into Babylon. Where really, what at the heart of that is just, I'm no longer dwelling in your presence, you are no longer under my provision, and you're no longer under my protection, you are in the hands of wicked nations and people around you. It's the consequences of breaking the covenant, and they do it all the time. The whole Old Testament is almost centrally about just showing us how laws break it, laws break it, laws. Which leads us to the next question. Really important question. Because it'll set up everything about our current understanding of the law. What that shows us is that the system didn't quite work, did it? Just human beings weren't able to do this. And you know what? I wanna say this, it's not completely their own fault because as we read in the scriptures, they were subject to a malevolent I never said that right. Malevolent force of evil, the serpent. They kept telling them to go the other way and they were inhabited after Adam and Eve, human flesh that is stained with this desire to go against the ways of God. So it seems like we have a problem here. It's not, it's not kind of working out. So what are the problems with the law? Let's, let's name them and, and let me just warn you Guys at home, take a breath, get a cup of coffee. You guys breathe in, breathe out. Because from this point onwards, we are getting many sub points, okay? It's so warning you all, we'll be out of here before um, dinner, okay? I promise. Two major problems with this system of the law. One, while the law, all of these instructions, the 613 plus, could describe how one ought to live in relationship with God and each other. What these instructions could not do is help somebody want to live in that way, nor could it give them the power to actually live in that way, considering the malevolent force of evil and the stain of human flesh. Couldn't do that. That's first. Important breakdown. Second was the problem of accumulated debt what New Testament authors call the curse of the law. 
the punishments, the right requirements of breaking this, just accumulating? How do we rid ourselves of this curse of the punishment from breaking it? And we're gonna answer those questions when we get to Jesus. We will get to Jesus, I promise. But before we do that, we need to just sit in this space. We're here in the Old Testament story. We're going, man, this is not working out. And still in the Old Testament, I wanna point out two incredibly important passages that already in the Old Testament start to show us, hey, just wait, something's coming. It's gonna solve these problems. Jeremiah 31, Ezekiel 36, critical passages. So let's go there. I know you all, you still got some endurance. Jeremiah 31, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, Exodus 19, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will then make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them and write it on their hearts. And I will be their God and, you'll say with me, they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and his brother saying, know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. Notice a couple of things. Notice the language of marriage again, right? They broke the covenant. He's, and he described himself as, what, did you pick it up? Husband. Notice number two, there's still the language about being his people. So it's still the personal language. The new one is still gonna be personal language. Notice number three, really important, the new covenant will still be about laws. But now, those laws will be written on their hearts. The laws will be located internally. And number four, really good news in the Old Testament, the promise that sins will be forgiven and erased. Just leave that there. Let's go to Ezekiel now, 36. Similar, but different in important ways. I will take you from the nations. By the way, this is now they've been exiled. I'll bring you back. I'll gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness and from all your idols. I will cleanse you. And I will give you, oh, this is beautiful. I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I'm gonna remove that heart of stone from your flesh and give you a soft, a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, my laws, that, um, and be careful to obey my rules. You shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers. And you say it with me, you shall be my people and I shall be your God. If you're doing homework there, I already gave you three. Notice a couple of things again. Still about his people, personal possession, personal relationship. Notice again, it's still about laws, but again located internally. And now, the best news from Ezekiel 36 is this promise of the Spirit given to us. So this hard heart that always points in the other direction, the stained heart replaced, heart transplant, with a soft one that is inclined to follow God and a spirit within us that's gonna help us live in a way that loves God and loves others. These are critical passages of the Old Testament about God's relationship with us. Okay, now, we're halfway. How are you doing? Okay, just breathe, stretch, maybe just for me. Okay, we're halfway there. It's gonna get a little trickier from here, you ready? Okay, so number four, so now, okay, we've seen what the purpose of it was, we've seen its breakdown, we've seen a promise that it's gonna be corrected. How did that get corrected? Now we enter, no, Jesus, okay? How does Jesus fulfill the law? Well, we know it has to do with solving those problems. We know it has to do with these promises. 
So how? Jesus arrives, and on the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter five, thousands of people talks about his kingdom, and he says this in verse 17, which is part of why this is such a complicated subject. He says these words, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. See, yeah, he's referring to law as the five books and then the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. What does he mean? Okay, we gotta get our heads around this. Firstly, what he means, this is interesting, not as critical, but interesting. What he means is he will fulfill the intention of the law, meaning he will be the one and only human being who will actually live out this way of life that God intended. He will obey all 613 plus. He will fulfill the intention of the law. He will show us it's possible in human flesh to live like this up on that later. Number two, this is probably the most important point about how Jesus fulfills the law is that he fulfills the righteous demands of the law. The problem of accumulated debt, or there's a curse that comes with having broken the punishment. He will fulfill that. He will satisfy that. This is Easter stuff in the atonement sacrifice on the cross, he would satisfy that once and for all so that the promise about forgiveness from Jeremiah 31 is actually possible. Can we just say amen to that and move on? But the third one is he would also fulfill, so not just what the law was pointing to or the righteous demands, but because of his sacrifice, his perfect sacrifice, because he died and because he was resurrected and vindicated by the Spirit, he could then fulfill the entire end goal of the law. Guys, this is really important because the end goal was to help human beings live in a way that loves God and loves each other. But they weren't able to do that. But he was able to do that. Why? Because he was God. And through his death and through his resurrection and his ascension to God, he could send the promised spirit who would turn these hard hearts into hearts of flesh that within us these laws would be written and within us the actual potential of living like this. Could have said I'm in there as well. That is how he fulfills everything about the law, what it's supposed to look like and how we end up looking like that. It's how Jesus fulfills it. So now the next question is, which is really the question in 1 Timothy. So now we're back to 1 Timothy. So everything I just said was introduction. Welcome, introduction, here's the actual sermon. Just joking. But actually, technically that's true. Because now we really are back to 1 Timothy. Because the big question, the problem here at Ephesus was this incorrect handling of the law. And so now we want to ask ourselves, so okay, in light of Jesus... And this fulfillment of the law, what does that mean for me, for us as Christians and for people alive today? Right, so number five, what is the lawful use of the law? So back to 1 Timothy verse eight. Hopefully the sentence will now hit you in a, in a new way. Now we know, Paul says, that the law is Good hasn't been abolished, it still has a purpose. This is important, guys. The problem was never the law, the problem was a malevolent force of evil and the stained human flesh that couldn't live that way. But the law is good, but, and we know the law is good if one uses it lawfully. So what is a lawful use of the law? This is where there's just tons of discussion. The reformers, the great reformers, Martin Luther, John Calvin, did a lot of work on this and tried to distill for us Christians today and people today what the use of the law is. And they said it in three ways. I've reworded it a little bit differently. But basically, how all of these law codes, the 613 plus function today is number one, to reveal the source of our brokenness. Number two, to drive us to Jesus. Number three, to guide us and everyone else about how to live life in a way that flourishes. So we're just gonna go through these quickly. Number one, to reveal the source of our brokenness. See, there's a purpose here. There's a reason why in verse nine to 11, Paul highlights specific 
commandments, instructions, laws that have been broken around sexuality, around physical abuse, and adds that statement at the end, and many other such things. We have these specific instructions to show us, to reveal to us the source of our brokenness. In other words, if you're brand new to Christianity, and I know there's not a lot of you here, but just let's imagine, you've never read the Bible, you've never heard anything, but you're kind of living a life uh, where you're you know, sleeping around, have multiple sexual partners, committing adultery with your spouse, bound up in pornography, and you're wondering why on earth there's such destruction around your life. What this shows you is here's the source of it. We were not designed to live in this way. When we live in this way with sexual purity, things work well. There's a flourishing with me and my relationship with the creator and with those around us. So as hard as they are, to read these instructions all through the New Testament and Old Testament as it presses upon us and convicts us, it's actually a good thing because what it's showing us is, hey, here's why you're experiencing the brokenness you're experiencing, which on its own is not enough, which is why you need point two. You need to know how that can be fixed, am I right? It's not just good enough to know, oh, okay, that's why. How can that be fixed? And that's why point two, to drive us to Jesus. If you've checked out of this whole sermon, that's okay, really, truly. But listen now, this is the one thing, the purpose of the Lord today, because it's in our passage, it's directly in our passage, is to drive us to Jesus. We realize through all the 613 plus how far we fall from God's intentions for us as individuals, as communities and societies, and we realize our desperate need to be rescued. And that pushes us in the Bible, so all these stories are connected, hey, to Jesus, if you don't know the answer. It is always Jesus. That's why Paul says the law is not for the just, but for the unlawful. Not to condemn them, to reveal their brokenness so that they can be driven to Jesus, have that accumulated debt paid for, receive forgiveness and healing, and now live in a way that leads to flourishing. Which leads me to the last point and last sub point. We're getting there. A lot of discussion around this point. I'm just gonna give you my view, which I believe in wholeheartedly. The law still functions today. All of it, the whole Bible, every weird command included, to guide us and everyone else into a flourishing life. Just give you an example. See, here's here's the conviction, my firm conviction. Remember, Torah, the law, is about instruction, revealing who God is, revealing who we are, and helping us live in a way that we can love God and love others. So in other words, if that's true, behind every weird instruction is a principle how to love God and love others. And if we can extract the principle, we can apply it today. I'm gonna give you an example of how that is done in the New Testament. So you can see I'm not just making this up. Just disclaimer, the particular example I'm gonna use is gonna appear to be self-serving to me. Just like, forgive me until we get there, okay? It'll make sense in a moment. So Deuteronomy 25 verse four is a weird commandment. You shall not muzzle an ox when it's treading out the grain. In your reading through the Bible, you made it through Leviticus, Numbers, you're like, oh my goodness, I'm so glad. Deuteronomy, and you get there. You're like, okay. I mean, anyone out there got, a, got an ox and is gonna go home and go, okay, now I know what to do. <laughs> I mean, does it really apply to us? Although it's very practical, I mean, it, ox is working, so don't muzzle it, you know, allow it to eat while it's working so it can perform and work better. What's weird about it is it's context, Deuteronomy 24, 25. All of those commands are about how people relate to each other. And here's this thing about an ox. Second Corinthians, would you believe it? The Apostle Paul, who says the law is good and is instructive, quotes that verse and applies it. Like this, 2 Corinthians 9, verse 9 to 10. For it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. Then he says this, is it for oxen that God is concerned? Was that law really about, you know, cruelty to animals? Does he not certainly speak for our sake? And then he emphasizes, that was written for our sake today. 
And the context here, by the way, this is why, forgive me, the context is literally about how you should be paying salaried staff who work in churches. I did not bring that out for that particular reason, but it, 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 incredible example, it wasn't really about abusing animals, it's actually just generically with human beings not abusing each other in workplaces, paying a fair wage, actually. Now this makes sense because we know at the end of the day, these commandments are not a behavior manual dropped out of heaven with random instructions. It's revealing who God is, revealing who we are, showing us how we can relate to him, how we can love him and love others that leads to flourishing. It's the right use of the law, of all the instructions. The wrong use. And I know we're out of time. Just give me three minutes, finish. The wrong use, which is what he's dealing with, the incorrect use. There's one obvious wrong use. If you believe that your covenant relationship with God, your marriage relationship, your being in relationship with him, if you believe that covenant relationship with God is determined by you obeying the statutory commands of a law code, then you're gonna die. Then you're not gonna make it. That's the worst possible use of the law. Just imagine, you're gonna appear before God one day, welcome to heaven. I'm not sure that's how it's gonna plan out. You know, and then you know, God's gonna say, why should I let you in? And you go, well, I kept all the commandments. And you go, really, how many were there? Did you keep note? Yeah, man, like 10, there were 10, right? No, 613, actually thousands in the rest of the world. Like if you dream, you're dreaming if you think that that covenant could be made or kept by keeping them. It's the wrong use of the law. The covenant relationship is only through faith in Jesus Christ. Number two, unlawful use of the law. We pointed this out earlier. What the law can do is tell you how we should live for our own benefit. What the law cannot do is give us the desire to live that way and the ability to carry it out. But the Holy Spirit can. So if you think you can just read these instructions and will yourself to do it, you can't. It's an incorrect use of the law. What Ezekiel and Jeremiah were pointing towards. So let's end. This actually is a helpful one liner verse here. Summarize what does a person who uses the law correctly, what do they look like? Here it is, verse 5. The aim of our charge, Paul's saying to me, this is why we're telling people this. The aim of our charge is this love. Love that issues from a pure heart, in other words, pure motivations, and a good conscience, a cleaned conscience, and a sincere faith. Hold on to that, you're gonna be okay. Let's pray. God, we have traveled through so much this morning. And I ask you today, as I should ask every time on Sunday, that you, Lord, you bring clarity to our minds. That beyond that, a settledness in our hearts about how to relate to you and each other. And, and beyond that, this hope, this great hope, that we have covenantal relationship with you simply through faith, faith in Jesus. And that through your spirit, we actually have the ability to live in a way that loves you and love others. May that be true of us. We pray in faith. Amen.